right, so picking up from last time, we've talked about the structure of the cell membrane. Let's talk a little bit about what can and cannot pass through. So the cell membrane is selectively permeable. What does that mean? Some things can pass and some can't. What can pass through the cell membrane are lipid-soluble molecules because, remember, it's mostly phospholipids. So things that are soluble or dissolve in lipids can pass through the membrane. Small nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen, I would memorize those two, can easily pass through because they're small, and again, they're nonpolar. Water can pass, but not so well because it's polar. However, technically, water freely flows through the membrane because of special channels called aquaporins. So technically, water can freely pass, but it's not so much because it can pass through the phospholipids. It's mainly because of these special protein channels. So those are called aquaporins, like water pores. What cannot pass through the membrane? Large molecules like sugar, they're too big, um, and especially if they're polar, and ionic compounds, or ionic um, even atoms, like hydrogen ions. Even though they're small, the charges are repelled by the phospholipids. And therefore, those things, although they can get into the cell, they have to go through special proteins in order to do so. So you can see in the animation, here comes sugar, large polar molecule. It can pass, but it has to go through proteins, not through the phospholipids. And this third molecule is too big, it can't pass at all. So now we're going to focus on the functions of the membrane, and particularly on transport, the movement of substances through the membrane. So first, a couple of definitions. Diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of lower concentration. And that's called going down the gradient. So just to be clear, the word gradient means there's a concentration difference. If there's a concentration difference, there is a gradient. And which way will things tend to diffuse? They will tend to diffuse down the gradient, meaning they'll go from the side that has more to the side that has less. And so if we look at this, and let's just say this is a solute particle that is able to pass through the membrane. That's what my line is representing. Um, this solute particle will tend to go this way, towards the side with less. Now, does that mean that the ones on this side are stuck? No. If one from this side hits, it will also go through. But notice the word net here. Net means the net movement means overall, if we add how many are going towards this side, and how many are going towards the other side, the net movement will be towards the side with less. And that makes sense because it, the chances of one hitting from the left, if there's a lot of them, are going to be much higher than the chances of one hitting from this side. If this one hits, it will go through. But what are the chances of one of these two, when they're randomly moving around, hitting? Much lower than the chances when there's a whole bunch of these hitting. So water, I'm sorry, so substances will tend to go from higher to lower concentrations. This is passive, meaning there's no energy required. This happens just because of the energy that the molecules already have just randomly moving around. And then osmosis is specifically the diffusion of water. So technically diffusion and osmosis, they both refer to the same process. Osmosis is just a bit more specific. It's specifically water going from higher to lower concentrations. So solutes will tend to go from higher to lower concentrations. Water will also tend to go from higher to lower concentrations. And again, here's a picture showing that you put on the left side of the membrane a solute, and on the right side of the membrane we have water. And what's going to tend to happen is the solute's going to tend to go to the right. Notice there's a picture in this picture. This one's going to the left. Why? Because they can go both directions, but the chances are much higher because there's so many more over here of one going this way. Eventually, we reach what's called equilibrium, and it's very, very important that you don't say that everything stops when it gets to equilibrium because that's not true. It's just that there will be no net change in concentration, meaning at that point, you have similar amounts going in both directions, so you're not going to see the change in one being, there's not going to be a gradient anymore, in other words. That's equilibrium. But it's sometimes called dynamic equilibrium because everything is still in motion. It's just that the amount going in each direction is the same. 
All right, and that brings us to something called tonicity. So in order to understand tonicity, tonicity has to do with problems involving which way water is going to go in a situation. You need to know some vocabulary. Hyper means more, hypo means less, iso means equal, and tonic refers to concentration. In other words, tonic refers to how much solute there is. So, and here's another thing. I can't have a beaker and say this is a hypertonic solution. That doesn't make any sense. In other words, these terms are only used when you're comparing one side to another side. It's just like I can't say, is she taller? Taller than who? You need to compare it to something. So what you could see is, you could see a situation like this with what's called, this is called a U-tube. This is a membrane. And you could be asked which side of this membrane is hypertonic or hypotonic. Or you could see a situation with a, a solution and a cell. And you could be asked which side is hypertonic or hypotonic, or is it isotonic. But the point is, you always have to be comparing two sides in order to use this terminology. So just to clarify that. Water will always go from where there's more water to where there's less water. The thing is, when you use the terms hypertonic and hypotonic, you're not really talking about water, you're talking about solute. In other words, a side that is hypertonic technically has more solute than the other side. And the side that is hypotonic has less solute than the other side. But then you're not asked which way the solute's going to go. Most of the time you're told that the solutes are not able to pass through the membrane and you're asked which way water's going to go. The easiest way to do these problems is just to memorize. Water will always go towards the hypertonic side. 100% of the time, water will go towards the hypertonic side. Why? Because that's the side with more solute. And if it has more solute, it technically has less water. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say I have a beaker and a cell, and inside my cell I have 5% sugar solution, and outside my cell I have a 10% sugar solution. Now, my first question is, which side is hypertonic? Is it the cell or is it the solution around the cell? Well. By our definition, hypertonic means more solute. Therefore, the side that would be hypertonic would be the solution, the side outside the cell. The second question you're asked is, if the sugar can't pass through the membrane, which way will water go? Well, the easiest thing to do, as I said, is just memorize water goes to the hypertonic side. So therefore, water should go out. But just to understand why, so again, you can just memorize, water goes towards the hypertonic side. Why does water go that way? Because water goes to the side with less water. Inside, we have 5% sugar. That means we technically have 95% water. That's the rest of the solution. And outside, we have 10% sugar. That means we have 90% water. So if we're looking at the water, and water always goes from where there's more water to where there's less, water's going to go out from where there's more to where there's less. But again, you don't have to, to calculate how much water there is to answer the question. You can just memorize water will always go towards the hypertonic side because the hypertonic side is always the side with more solutes, and if it has more solutes, that means it has less water. Here's a few more definitions that go with this. So if the solution is isotonic, it means that there's similar amounts of solute on each side or the same amount of solute. There will be no net osmosis. Remember, if you were asked which way will water go in this situation, your answer should be that water will go both ways. If you say water won't move, you're going to get it wrong. Because that's not true. It's just that the amount of water going in both directions should be equal, so there's no net osmosis, meaning the concentration isn't going to change. If it's not isotonic, then you have to figure out which side's hyper and which side is hypo. Again, hypotonic will be the side with less solute, and technically that means it'll have more water, and water will always leave the hypotonic side, and water will always go towards the hypertonic side because that is the side with more solute, and technically more solute means less water. 
So here's a couple of problems with this. Oh, I'm sorry, this is just an animation showing water going towards the hypertonic side, which is the side that has the green balls, that's the sugar solution. And this is another picture, the green balls are, are a solute, the water goes towards the side, and notice how the, the level of water actually ends up higher on that side. And now, this is isotonic, this is equilibrium, why? Because if you notice, the molecules are equally spread out. So maybe this started out with 10% solute, and this was 5%, and now they're both at whatever, 7.5%, because the water has diluted the right side. And here's some practice problems. So problem number one, which side is hypertonic? Neither. This is an isotonic situation. The cell and the solution both have the same amount of sugar. Problem number two, we have 10% salt in the cell, 2% outside. That means our cell has more solute, so it is hypertonic. And out here, my solution is hypotonic. Which way will water go? Water will go to the hypertonic side, so water will go into the cell, towards the hypertonic side. Now, if salt could pass, if you were asked which way will salt go if salt can pass, salt would go out. Salt will go from where there's more to where there's less. Everything goes from where there's more to where there's less. We're pretending like the salt can't pass, and only the water can. Water is going from where there's more to where there's less. If we look at this, technically outside is 98% water, and inside is only 90% water. So the hypertonic side, again, ends up being the side with less water. Last situation, 30% salt outside and only 10% inside. So outside is hyper, inside is hypo, and this time water will go out of the cell. This cell might burst. This cell would shrivel up. And then this is a YouTube problem. So it asks, which side is hypertonic at the start? Now, notice in this case, there's two solutes. To figure out which side is hypertonic, you're literally just going to add them together. Also, notice they used molarity instead of percent. It doesn't matter. You're just going to add them together. This side is 0.9 molar. This side is 1.2 molar. The higher the molarity, it's just like high, higher Excuse percentage. Excuse the interruption. Derek Lane, so, please report to student services. Derek Lane. Hyper, hypo. So which side is hypertonic? Side B. Now, notice the second question. If glucose can pass, which way will it go? We're not talking about hypertonic, hypotonic here. We're just looking at glucose. Remember, any solute that can pass is going to go from where there's more to where there's less. So glucose will go towards side A because it's going to go from where there's more glucose, 0.8, to where there's less glucose, 0.4. And finally, let's say the glucose can't pass and neither can the salt, and only water can pass. They're asking which way water will go. Now you look at the hyper-hypo thing. Notice this side is hypertonic, so water will go towards side B, because technically that's the side with more solutes, and therefore it has less water. So hopefully that gives you a, an overview of how to solve tonicity problems. Here's a couple of pictures. Blood cell in pure water, it bursts. And in salt water, it shrivels, and I'm going to show you a slide of this. And plant cell in pure water gets stiff, which makes sense because they have the vacuum in the cell wall. And in salt water, it shrivels. Here's the blood cell. In the center, that's normal. To the left, we see them swelling, and the word says ghost there. That's a cell that's popped. And on the right side, see how shriveled they are. Plant cell, on the other hand, in the middle, isotonic, so they're eh, kind of in the middle. On the left, that is uh, in a hypotonic solution. The cell is all swollen up. That's perfect. That's what we want, so the plant looks nice and stiff. And on the right is in a hypertonic solution, like salt water, and the plant cells have shriveled up, which would be bad.